right, are you ready to bring him out here? Mitch Pelleggi and William B. Davis. You can all throw tomatoes later. William Davis's video. Let's run it now. First, Mitch uh, Pelleggi was, uh, grew up uh, a big portion of his life in Turkey. He went to college and studied business. His father was a, was a arms, uh... Who's a contractor? Contractor, yeah. arms contractor. <laughs> now this is, you were an athlete in high school. This is my question. Why didn't you actually become an FBI agent? I uh, try to figure out what I've been doing for the last however many years of my life. Because like, I, I actually started working on DOD contracts myself at a certain point. So it was it was interesting to be able to fall into you know a government position like that in my acting career. Yes, right. <laughs> he was here killing a lot of people through other <laughs> other roles. And uh, and William Davis, if you don't know, had his own acting school, has his own acting school in Canada. And one of the famous alumni of the acting school is Lucy Lawless, Xena Warrior Princess. But before that, also worked as an assistant director in England, working underneath Sir Laurence Olivier. <laughs> now, this is, this is the qu my first question for you gentlemen. Both of you, when your roles first started, they weren't going to be these massive roles that they became, right? You originally came in for, for just smaller parts. When did you first realize that this was going to become something huge within the within the arc? Well, you were there first. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. So no, for, for me, it, it, it was even the more surprising, I suppose, because I, I was just they were shooting a pilot in Vancouver. I was running my school and I auditioned, and they I auditioned for the senior FBI agent. This character had three lines, and I got this part with no lines. <laughs> My friend Ken Camera got the part with the three lines. 
We've laughed about it ever since. But I've laughed probably more, more so than you. <laughs> did, did he frame that paycheck? <laughs> now, here's the question, though. You, you came in with no lines, uh, and yet there were some, some choices that you made in this character that compelled the writers to bring this character back again and again. What was your process? What, what did you bring to that, that extra role? Really, because many of us have been extras in television shows here in Utah. What did you bring to that? Well, it's not really complicated on the first season, but um, I was kind of a background, you know, and I'm watching this scene and I'm thinking, here I am standing as if I'm a background actor watching a scene. And I thought, this doesn't do. So there was a filing cabinet right beside me. So I leaned on the filing cabinet, crossed my legs, smoked my cigarette, and turned into a praying mantis. <laughs> You can buy the trading card if you want. It's so when your acting coach tells you to bark like a dog or act like a praying mantis, it can make the difference between a $50 bit part or being the uh, Darth Vader or devil of the series. So, so Mitch, tell me about, about your journey in this, in this character as the assistant director of the FBI. How did that grow? Well, you know, I actually just came in for, I think it was, I, I had auditioned for the role, or for, for the X-Files a couple times before, and Chris didn't hire me. And so when they, they called me back, come back in, I don't know, you guys probably heard this story, but uh, when I came back in, I, I came, I, I wasn't going to go back in, because he's, he's seen me twice. If he wants to hire me, he can just hire me, you know, and, and uh, so my agent talked me, thank God, into, into <laughs> going back into the room, and, and I walked into the room, and I had, I was, had a very surly attitude. I was just like, I, I was like, just pissed off, and, and, uh, and fortunately, that's what he wanted for the character. <laughs> and I said, after, after I finished reading, I said, I said, anything, because, because a lot of times you don't get directed in, in, in these, these sessions, you know, and, and I said, I said, anything else, because I can't be directed. And he said, no, it was great. I said, are you sure? <laughs> and he said, yeah, that was great. And I, and I said, all right. And I just walked out of the room. And, and then I got the role. And, and I didn't know what it was going to be. I, you know, I think that they were looking for somebody to fill that role uh, of their being their superior. And they did, I don't know if they knew exactly what direction it was going to take. Because at first, as you know, it, it's, it, it appeared that, that Skinner was pretty much in cahoots with CSM. And um, as, as time, you know, as, as things evolved and, and time went on, it, it, uh, it, it changed substantially, so. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, it, I, you know, I, I think they, and also Jillian was pregnant at the time, and she was gonna be missing a, a, some work, so they needed somebody to kind of fill in that, that, that void, so I was, I was uh, very happy to, uh, to do that. Um, and here we are. <laughs> so, <laughs> so method acting works. If you're going to be somebody who's pissed, come in actually pissed. <laughs> now, here's the next. You, you mentioned that you uh, originally were going to be connected with Cigarette Smoking Man here, and this is, this is how it started. And so tell us about that scene where you made the Get Out of My Office, the famous Get Out of My Office scene, where suddenly those things... Yeah, you can applaud that. Get Out of My Office scene. Where suddenly those things changed. Yeah, well, that was, you know, um, it, it, was, it was interesting because, I mean, because of, because of the nature of, of, of the character, I think he's a very, very, uh, very ethical, very, very moral, very strong, you know, um, uh, individual in that respect. And when he realized this, that that cigarette smoking man was lying to him, that was like, you know, that just didn't, that didn't fit into who he was. Wait, 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 wait. He was actually just lying his ass off. Is really what it was. I don't remember that part. That's okay, he still thinks that he was the good guy on the show. So well, deluded. Well, I thought that was obvious. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it just and then when that you know at that at, when that line came up, I played it. So you didn't know who I was saying it to. You didn't know if I was saying it to Mulder or if, or if I was saying it to Bill. And um, and you know and, and then when he re and he didn't know either, or, or the CSM didn't know. And the way the way that Bill played it, he did he acted as if he was all smug and like, yeah, Mulder, take off, you know. And and, uh, and then he realized that I was talking to him. And that was that was the point I think that 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 the CSM and Skinner became mortal enemies. I did get in one more puff of a cigarette. He did, he did, yeah. He probably flicked some ashes on my carpet. 
it's very interesting about about the cigarette, as as uh, I don't know if everybody in the room knows, but but you were a smoker when you were very young, but you gave it up in your thirties in the nineteen seventies. Correct. Yeah. And and when you were brought back on the show, the first uh, show you you started with a tobacco cigarette, but then you chose to run from that. Yeah. What we well, yes. What happened was, as I say, I was just uh, this one episode, so far as I knew. So they said, do, you know, do you want to smoke real cigarettes or these herbal cigarettes? Said, no, no, no. I'm an actor. Give me the real cigarettes. It's great. You know? <laughs> and then uh, you know, time went by. I wasn't in any more episodes. Then I, they called me for another episode. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, I'll have a real cigarette. Uh, sure, 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 sure. And then I'm sitting at home and I'm thinking. Gosh, I wish they'd call me for that X-Files show. <laughs> uh, so that's when I switched. <laughs> so, so you switched to herbal and, you, and you've even done work in anti-smoking campaigns. That's right. It, uh... <laughs> that's big in Utah. Yeah, the Canadian Cancer Society and, and I worked together for a while. Uh, uh, turning my uh, notoriety with the cigarette to our advantage to discourage people from smoking. I used to always feel so bad for Bill because on the first, first, when the movie come back for a new season, on the first episode, the, the, the Bill came back and, and, and had, to, had to light up one of those. It's still, the herbals were just, they, they, they smelled horrible. And, and they still, when he, when, he would, when he would smoke, you could, it was always the first day that he would have to smoke one of those things again. It was like, you could just see him turning green and start like <laughs> reeling, you know? <laughs> it was, I felt so bad for him. Now, as an actor, how much backstory did they give you, seeing, seeing how these characters were in development? How, how much backstory did they give you and how much did you have to create on your own? Uh, zero and a hundred percent. I don't know about you, but I got no backstory. Um, I don't think I ever had a discussion with anyone about the character until we were going into the reboot, and that's uh, like 15 years later. <laughs> so, so for me, it was always, uh, it was always okay. This is what I have to play. What backstory do I need to play it? And it would change. I mean, in the early time, I thought I was the top guy. You know, I thought I had big power, and then all of a sudden, there's this syndicate of guys, and I am being scolded for being late for a meeting. <laughs> so I have to adjust my backstory. I don't, I didn't have any, I still don't have a backstory. I'm still... <laughs> you and Stephen Williams, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. Now, they eventually gave you a little backstory with, uh, with the episode in yeah. Vietnam. Yeah, they, where, they did. Where yeah. you received some pretty serious calls from real Vietnam veterans. That called to thank you. Yeah, I, I guess I, I you talked about I, that in a previous. I, have, I, I can't remember. I, can't remember. <laughs> I just had breakfast. And I can't remember. That's what I had okay. for breakfast. Um, yeah, no, I, it was that was uh, the the writing in that scene was great, and um, and it was it was uh, and it did it did it really lent a lot to, to who Skinner was um, and how he looked at things. Um, and, and I have you know in at interaction with with vets um, at, at these things and. and um, Different uh, social media has, has been, you know, very. Uh, uh, it's been very gratifying to to have the response that uh, that I got from it. Now, oh yeah. Now, God bless our vets. Yes. <laughs> Having such characters of great uh, notoriety, characters that are so recognizable and known, how has that affected? the rest of your career? Do you find that you are typecast in those characters? Do you find that you are asked to do more things than you were before? How has it affected you to be such a known character? Well, considering I went from that to playing Darby on Sons of Anarchy, there was just... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, it, it, um... You know, it, it really, it really, it, yeah, one, one thing that I've always, that I always noticed when I would go into a casting session, if, if somebody, if the, if the producer or director said, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the X-Files, I knew I wasn't getting the role. Then it happened over and over and over until I did, That's until I walked point. in. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm, that, I, you find I, that? Now that you mentioned it, I've noticed that. <laughs> because, because obviously they identify you, you know, with that character so strongly that they can't see you as, as, 
you know, somebody else. But uh, when I walked in and met Kurt Sutter on, on Suns, he said that. And I was like, okay, well, I might as well just get up and walk out. But he gave me the job. So, um, so that, was, that, that kind of broke that, uh, that, uh, that streak. Um, yeah, it's hard to say for me because uh, it's, it's been mixed. I mean, there was a wonderful series uh, shot in Vancouver, a uh, lot of terrific roles. I didn't get so much as a look in. Um, and uh, the story seems to be that they didn't want a recognizable um, character interfering with their sense of, of reality. Uh, mind you, their sense of reality was a little skewed, I thought, because they all. They always talk like this, you know, so they're always very natural. It was one of those, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're very real, you know, so, like Robert Downey Jr. and you can't understand a word he's saying. You know. but, um, but it's very real. I mean, lots of people you can't understand what he's saying. Uh, uh, I digress. Uh, um, uh, it has opened a lot of doors as well. And uh, I mean, a good thing for me, I, I like to think, is that I'm quite different from the character that I play on the X-Files. <laughs> and I actually do smile sometimes, and I actually laugh every once in a while. <laughs> so, so they're open to casting me in, in, in different kinds of roles, so that's worked out pretty well. It's not always fair. It's not always the evil, maniacal glare. It's sometimes a laugh. And, and now, there were two different major themes in the show for me. One was the, uh, the truth is out there, a very optimistic view. And then the other was trust no one, a, a kind of a pessimistic view. Which of those two do you like more in the show and do you like more in your own life? Well, I think the truth is out there. I just think that we, we're having a hell of a time finding it. You know? and I mean, I actually tweeted a bazillion about it. Our journalists have a hard time really, you know, getting things straight. You, you, see, you see one story reported and then immediately it's refuted, you know, or, or contradicted by something or someone else. Um, and I got in a big Twitter fight with some jackass. <laughs> I kind of like getting in Twitter fights, it's a little fun. But, uh, Vega, you rock too. You all rock, our fans rock, you guys are the best. The truth, I, I don't know, you know, it's, it's, uh, believe the lie, I mean, it's, I, I, it's all, you know, I, I, I can't figure out what we're, what we're trying to say or do in this, this world. <laughs> Um, I, just uh, to throw in, uh, uh, I am a, I am a, a believer in the scientific method. I believe it's a, it's a way that we can get close to, to something that's actual. Uh, it's always changing, of course, as new evidence comes comes out. But there is, in a sense, a truth. Um, and I will, I will jump out of line here and say, and one of the truths is we're in peril and we're in peril because of climate change. And we have to do so. I'm, I'm happy that climate change received a bigger applause than I believe in science. <laughs> that, was, that was very strange. Uh, now, now uh, a question, a question I, I, would, uh, I have to ask. Uh, as, as some of you know, how many of you, just so I know, have ever seen me perform? So, so I have a magic show. I'm a magician, and uh, and that's how I make my living. And, and and Mitch, you you were the host of the Secrets of Magic movie. <laughs> you were the host of the Secrets of Magic revealed. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mass Magician is no longer allowed in any magic clubs or conventions in the world. Why did you do that terrible, terrible show? Because the Fox threw so much money at me. It was <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I just I look back. I don't know. My my thing is like, you know, because it was the dialogue was so cheesy, and and and, and, the, and the character was, and I, and I referred to him as a character because I, that wasn't me. It's like he was so lecherous, you know, towards the poor poor uh, magician's assistants, and and uh, they were pretty though. <laughs> So can I tell all the magicians you're sorry now? I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean it. 
but also, uh, William is, is, sits on skeptic boards and speaks at skeptic conferences. Well, uh, well uh, it was actually X-Files that got me into that because, um, you know, a lot of fans don't really understand how it works with actors like, uh, like if, I, if, I, if I may say, like Mitch and me, who are kind of in the trenches, um, and we do the work we get. Uh, we're not the A-list actors who get a whole bunch of things and, uh, oh no, I won't do that, no, no, I, won't. I don't like that, I'm not doing We got a part, let's do it. <laughs> So, but people would come up to me and say, and assume I'm doing the X-Files because I believe in all these things. And people wanted to take me on skywalks to look at UFOs, and, and they bring me the latest information on Area 51, and, and assume that I was really fascinated. And finally I said, you know, I don't actually believe in these things. And they said, you don't? I said, well, and they said, well, why not? And I said, well, the onus is on you to prove that they exist. I, I, it's not on me, I can't prove a negative. And they said, oh, but we have. And at that point I was stopped because I didn't know actually what they had proved or what they had said or, or what the arguments were in favor of Area 51 or not or UFOs or whatever. So finally, I, I happened to hear a radio program with the late Barry Byerston, who was a, uh, a, a, a member of a group called the, called PSYCOP the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, which is part of the uh, Committee for Free Inquiry. And it's a fascinating organization, and they have looked at these things, and they've established, that they've set up um, trials to, to prove or disprove various, uh, um, everything, for everything from dowsing to UFOs. And so uh, I became fascinated by all this, and I ended up, as I say, giving some talks on it and becoming known somewhat as the skeptic. Can, can, you, can you see if I get reinstated to going to the Magic Castle? <laughs> I want you to know, my poster hangs in two places in the Magic Castle, and if you want to go, I'll go with you, but I'm going to wear a body shield. <laughs> Yeah, no, seriously, I'll get you in if you'd like. The, uh, now, now the, you also hosted a, a show on, on uh, conspiracy, did we go to the moon or not? Yeah, I was just thinking about that, yeah. Where's, <laughs> where's Buzz? Where's Buzz? <laughs> well, I, I waited Once again, they threw a lot of money at me. I was a whore. I mean, I <laughs> It wasn't as if I was, if I had any question, it was like they were saying, well, you just kind of like, you know, this, do this, you know, uh, host it, you know, I'm like, okay, well, but I, we, we landed on the mountain. So. <laughs> and now to punch you in the face, Buzz Aldrin, everybody. <laughs> no, no, no. What are some of your roles? This is my last question for now, and then we'll, we'll invite some audience questions. Do, do we, uh, the, if you want to ask mine's question, start to line up here. Uh, do you, what is, uh, if we could go out and see one role that you've played, something outside of the X-Files, what would you like us to go out and watch of each of yours? Mine would be a, an episode of Criminal Minds that I did. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's probably, I'm, I'm probably most proud of that, of, of anything that I've done on, in front of a camera. So, uh, I mean, I, I've done a lot of stage work that I'm very, very, very proud of. I mean, I'm happy. I'm, I'm very, very proud of my role as, as, as Skinner, but um, th this this was, was very different from, I don't usually get cast in this type of a role, and, and uh, uh, director called me and asked me if I would do it, and I was I was I was so thankful once I did it because it was uh, it really it really pushed me uh, as an actor. So, uh, and I'm very proud of, of, of the way it turned out. So go see Criminal Minds. And when I was 12, I played Aladdin. I think you should have seen that. <laughs> That. <laughs> a little Chinese boy named Aladdin is how it starts in the in the Thousand and One Arabian Nights. Let's open up for questions. Our first question from the audience. Okay, this I address to both of you. Um, whether you were in them or not, were there any given episodes for the X Files that you felt relatable? That felt relatable to who you are. I mean, 
whether your cause or whatnot. You could apply to yourself. Uh, I can briefly answer that. Um, I was uh, I was very happy that I actually got uh, in episode in the last episode of the reboot to actually talk about climate change. I actually said I'm not responsible for the heating of the planet, and threw that in Mulder's face. You know, I, like I said, I can't remember what I have for breakfast, so it's hard for me to remember a lot, a lot of stuff. But I, I do know that, that you know, the playing the character, and I, I, you've probably heard this story too. My, my, when my, my mom and when she was still alive, and my brothers and sisters, they watched the first episode, uh, and, and my dad had already passed at that point, so he wasn't he wasn't able to to really enjoy um, the whole thing that I that I went through. But uh, when when they when they saw my my portrayal, um, they said, "That's dad." You know, and so I, I, I really infused my father into into that character because that was very much. And when I when I look at it now, I go, wow, that, that really was dad, and uh, and that 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 fills my heart. I, I, I just add one little related anecdote to that because, as many of you know, I tended to smoke like this holding the cigarette like that. I never really knew why I did that. That just sort of happened. And then when I was preparing my book, which incidentally we're supposed to talk about because I'm selling my book here and my autobiography, um, I came across a picture of my father and that's how he was smoking. Memoirs of a cigarette smoking man available signed for $50 at his table. Let's come over here. Next question. Or where? Oh, perfect. Right here. <laughs> I had like seven questions and you asked them all, so thank you for taking all of my thunder. So I've got a few ones though. So, for both of you, I, are you both from Canada? I think you just went. Just me. I'm married to a Canadian though, okay. so I got it. So, my question is during all of the filming there, it's supposedly set on the east coast of the U.S. Did you ever get a chance to come out and tour Langley or the FBI headquarters or anything like that, do any research in the U.S.? I did not, no, I was, I was never, uh, but I mean, I have met FBI, agent, FBI, FBI agents over the years, and, uh, uh, but that, that's really the only interaction that I ever had. No, and I, no, never, they, they didn't invite me to Area 51 or any of these places. <laughs> I love that, you know, they, there's, there's a story when they used to go shoot exteriors of the, of the uh, Hoover building. Um, the, when uh, the FBI, FBI, I can't even say FBI, when the FBI agents knew that they were out there shooting, they would put big X's in the windows of the building, which I thought was pretty cool. I think we had a lot of fans within the FBI. Next up. Okay, so my question is for you, William. I'd like to ask about the finale of the revival. There's a scene where Spender takes part of his face off. How was that accomplished for the TV? I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, um, with difficulty, um, four and a half hours in the makeup chair. Um, we're dedicated, if nothing else. Um, so there's a series of prosthetics um, that are adhered to my face. Why it takes four and a half hours to adhere them to my face, I'm not sure. Um, but the, the piece that is the cheek, the cheek piece that comes off, obviously comes off last, or is put on last, and uh, underneath it are just two, two dots, two little X marks. Uh, for them to set up the CGI to show the hollowed face. The hollowed face was never there. That's, that's a CGI um, computer-generated image. Uh, but all I, so all I had to do was just flip off this one piece of prosthetic. So, what was your favorite way you ever died? It's interesting, after, I, after the main run of the X-Files, you're asking what kind of parts I did, I died 15 times on screen. I really want somebody to put them all together into one kind of 
image of what kind of video. Um, but I think I flew over the top of a car once. That was pretty good. <laughs> William Davis, he dies so well. <laughs> So you both mentioned that you didn't really have a backstory provided to you. Was there something you would have liked to see about your backstory added to the show? You would have liked to see a family life scene or just to make you more relatable? I'd like to know what happened to my wife. <laughs> I have no idea. She just was there and then she's gone. But then the wedding, wedding ring came back in the last six episodes. What's that? Then your wedding ring came back in the last few episodes. Well, that, that, my story on that was, what happened was the first day of shooting, I'd forgotten to take my wedding ring off. <laughs> so uh, so my, my story is that, that Skinner married his secretary. <laughs> it was played by my real wife, partly. So, I, I mean, I still don't know what happened to my wife. I know she's up there somewhere. She was, she was abducted. Um, we, um, it's, it was too, Tenny Wise and Tom Foolish. We did an episode, we shot it uh, with Kim directing, uh, set in the 70s. And we, we, did, we were all made up to look really young. We had uh, wigs and it showed us as, uh, Hero, well, not heroes, but uh, dedicated uh, um, young men with uh, trying to change the world and trying to change it in, in the ways that it had to be changed. And uh, it was fascinating. And, and there you would have had a, a terrific backstory. And, um, Mulder's father and I were partners at the time, and it was pretty exciting. What happened was they rented wigs that they were not allowed to cut. And so when they finally shot it, and they, they, they could, it was just not convincing that we were believable. And so all that's left, there's one picture of, of me with, uh, with Mulder's father, and that's, that's what all that survived from that episode. But that was too bad. It was like, it was like really long hair, wasn't it? So you was it was, you know, it was so interesting, you know, because we, we went into the makeup, room and they, you know, they pulled, they, they gave us kind of facelifts and long hair and stuff and we'd come out of the makeup room and we'd be young and we'd be alive and we'd feel so great and, you know, then we'd go back and they'd take it all off. <laughs> we'd go home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So for want of a wig budget, that part is no longer canon. Next question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for doing this panel. I have a question for William. I'm a dentist, and um, you talked about smoking and quitting and so forth, and I'm always trying to convince people to quit smoking. Would you give them any uh, professional um, suggestions of what you did to help you quit smoking? I don't, I, you know, I don't. Um... I know I tried to quit several times. Um, there, I mean, there were two factors in my life that made, made it work for me. Oh, no, there's about three. Um, uh, I had started to run, and I was spinning all the way around the track, so that was, to not want to do that was good. But the, what really got worked for me is people lied to me. They told me it only takes three days. <laughs> you, just, you just need to take three days and then it's done. So I thought, well, I can do it. suffer for three days. So I went away to my ski cabin. I told my family um, I didn't want to put my anxiety on them, so I went by myself. In truth, I didn't want their anxieties on me. I wanted it as calm as possible. And uh, three days later, I had stopped smoking. But then there was another six months. <laughs> but, no, but, but because I had believed that it was only three days that worked for me. So I'm not really helping you. I'm saying, <laughs> lie to your people. Tell them it takes only three days. No. Best way, best way to quit smoking is quit smoking. It's simple. No, it's not. It's really not simple. I quit smoking about four years ago, and it was I, I started using uh, um, electronic cigarettes. And, and actually, Patrick Duffy, when I was doing Dallas, shamed me into it. 
he was like, every time he'd come to the set, he'd hug me and he'd go, oh, it's, no, it's, it's good to smell you again, or something like that. And, you know, and then my daughter was, you know, it, it, she, she kind of was, you know, I asked her, actually, after I quit smoking, I was somebody walked by who was, who was a smoker, and, and I looked at her and I said, baby, did I smell like that? And she looked at me and she was like, yeah, daddy. And I was like, I'm so sorry. And it's like, you know, but uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, you know, and, and, uh, but I have to tell you, man, it's like, I'm so, of course, now I'm, not, now I'm a non-smoking Nazi, so it's, it's uh, that's, that's the... That's me as well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we only have about five minutes left, so let's do some speed round here, where we answer their questions as fast as we can, just to get through the rest of our, as much as we can of our line. Here we go. Mitch, this question is directed at you. I recently attended the Supernatural Convention in Vegas and heard a lot of stories about the boys and the pranks and all the things that they pulled. Do you have a story that you can share with us about Jared and Jensen? Did they ever prank you? What was it like working with them on the set? It's constant. <laughs> That's about as fast as I can answer that. Yeah, they're, they're just, they're brats. <laughs> but I love them both. They're two of the best people I've ever met in my life, and I adore them. They, yeah, they, they do pull their pranks. Next up. This one is primarily for Mitch. Uh, you were in an 80s movie called Three O'Clock High that was filmed at Ogden High oh, School. And I just wanted to hear more about that. And uh, was that your first experience in Utah? And have, uh, what do you think about our wonderful state? It, you know, it, it was my first experience and we had a great time. It was a lot of fun and, and everybody was really nice and they took great care of us. And, and, uh, and I have shot up in Park City too. And, and it, was, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. So it's uh, you got a beautiful state here, and y'all y'all are really uh, really nice people and very very. Sweet. So this question is for William. Um, towards the beginning of the show, you're shown as more of an antagonist as the show moves on, and especially in Musings of a Cigarette Smoking Man, you're shown more as a sympathetic character. Where do you think you fall on that? Are you more of an antagonist, or do you think you more of a sympathetic character? I, I think I'm an antagonist. I mean, I think I, I think what has to be in the story. I have to tell you my whole story. Where I think Mulder is the antagonist, and I'm the protagonist. But we won't do that. No, I'm the antagonist. And, and, That's a speed answer. And are you his father? Are you Mulder's father? Yes. <laughs> Next question. Hi, uh, this is for William. I was wondering if you could give any advice to fellow skeptics and science lovers on how we can diplomatically discuss these ideas with our friends and loved ones who might encourage uh, pseudoscience or anti-scientific ideas. <laughs> oh, that's so hard. I, I mean, I have a brother who's a scientist, but he's a denier on climate change, and it's, I just can't understand it. Um, I think, but what I've watched some people do it, the Barry Byerston, who I talked about before, is you have to listen, and you, you, you can't, uh, you, you have to receive what they, what they give you. That's, that's the best I can say. Okay, this question is for William B. Davis. I'm a geology major currently at Utah Valley University, and we study geology, and, I, and I'm a supporter of climate change. I was going to ask, have you been to any scientific conferences regarding climate change? Um, I, I, yes. Uh, not exactly a scientific conference, exactly, I suppose, but I've certainly been to events uh, uh, surrounding the subject of climate change, and I've listened to some of the, the big people talk about it, like Tim Flannery and so on. And this is our last audience question. Hi. Do you have a favorite memory, story, or scene from filming The X-Files, like a certain bubble bath? Mine is telling serious Bogey Man to pucker up and kiss my ass. <laughs> I was going to a convention in London and meeting my wife. Okay, mine was meeting my wife on the show too. You stole that from me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one more time for Mitch Valenci and William B. Davis.